Hi, Greg Weldon, back at you with another episode of Money, Markets, and New Age Investing. And today, I want to talk about the most recent podcast, Exit Stage Left, where I was suggesting that taking some risk capital off the table, particularly in the U.S. stock market, wouldn't be such a bad idea. Now, certainly comments from Jerome Powell changed the narrative, but having said that, it's still the right move, and it still was the right move, because in so doing, what I was preaching was being long stuff over paper. And what Powell did by shifting the narrative to our next move will not be a rate hike, uh, really, you know, is part of this whole bigger picture with the Fed, where two meetings ago, the dot plot showed two and a half percent, uh, um, inflation in 2026, 2.5% real GDP growth and 2.5% Fed funds. And what did I say then? I said, the Fed will ultimately move to an inflation target from 2 to 3% likely, ditching just the 2% target. And that's right in the middle. And now he's saying, well, the next move will not be to hike rates. And with inflation still below 5, the Fed is still neutral to restrictive at five and a half, you know, so if inflation gets to five, then you have an issue, then you're neutral. And maybe they want to be neutral based on what we're going to talk about with the economy. And if that's true, it's another sign of acquiescing to higher general rates of inflation, because inflation expectations on behalf of the consumer are well north of 3%. And more than twice as many people say consumers, New York Fed survey, uh, say inflation will be above 4% within the next 12 months, as say will be 2% or below. So it's still the right move to downsize the paper part of your portfolio and upsize the stuff part of the portfolio. That was the bigger picture message with exit stage left. And it plays, it has played because... You know, stuff that we've been involved in, like copper, gold, and silver in particular, but uranium and a few other things uh, uh, have soared. So, and outperformed the U.S. stock market by a large degree. And even in the stock market, what are the three of the top five performing sectors are defensive, staples, materials, and utilities. So we're going to talk more about that at the second half of the of the podcast when I come back to strategy. Let's talk about kind of the macro reasons why I said what I said two weeks ago and why I say it again here now, all right? Because the consumer is in trouble, all right? We start with the inflation numbers. CPI came in at 3.4, and everyone was all happy that it's down from 3.5. And, man, it's kind of low compared to 9, right, and all of this. No, no. 12 months in a row, it's been above three. And the average over the last 12 months is 3.4. And this was the number we got for March, excuse me, for April. So in that context, that's still 140 basis points or almost double the Fed's target rate, okay? And what's interesting is if you look at the inflation number, it bottomed right at 3%, all right? So, uh, and and basically that used to be the high before the pandemic, if you had inflation that was high, it was pushing 2.6, 2.7. Now it's at its low end of the range at 3%. And the reason for this, of course, is $35 trillion in public debt in the U.S. We can talk about that more in a minute, too. But what's interesting in that context is to note that the inflation expectations, the University of Michigan survey was at 3%. All right, for three months in a row and bounced to 3.3. The New York Fed survey was at 3% for four months in a row, the one year ahead uh, outlook, and it jumped to 3.3. And it's the same thing. You know, you are now at a level where 3% is kind of seen as the bottom of inflation. And the Fed has almost kind of said that's okay because growth is still strong. We're at five and a half, which you know, versus th three and a half is still restrictive policy measure. So, and the labor market is not rolled over yet, even though inside it has, just not above ground. That's the way I like to look at it because I dig deep. And when you dig deep, you see the numbers early. 
All right, the numbers need to be seen above ground for the bulk of people to see them, so the market will react because you need the bulk of the people to react. You know, I'm not going to move the markets, and if I think it's true, so on and so forth. But when we go back to inflation expectations, what's interesting is the percentage of consumers that said they expect inflation to be above 4% jumped from 40.2% last month to 444 It's up 4 more than four full percentage points. That's a 10% jump in the percentages, all right? And so that's number one. It's more than double the percent of uh, consumers who expect inflation to be 2% or below. So that's kind of interesting to me. And when you look at the five-year uh, expected rate of inflation, it bottomed at 2%. In the second half of 2022, and it's all the way back up to 2.9, just shy of three. 2.8, 2.9, just a tick off of three. So again, two to three percent. That's the five year ahead. Five year ahead expectation. Five years of three percent inflation. That means higher interest rates are here to stay. You know, maybe they come down to four, three and a half. If you have, you know, something a recession, they could bring them to three or lower. You know, so uh, we'll see. All right. So in all of that context, again, when you have all these things, when we look at inflation expectations in the New York Fed survey, gasoline, 4.8%, food, 5.3%, medical, 87 college tuition, 9 and rent, 9.1%. When you take the CPI number, all right, here's some of the components of the CPI, because we know that food has been down, but we know that food is kind of bottomed here and gasoline and, and energy you know had been negative is now positive on a base effect look at what's happening already with electricity all right so just let me read off some of the most recent the numbers came out last week all right on inflation the core rate was 3.6 but many components are still above four and above five services excluding energy 5.3 you have a home i mean you know, rent is 5.4. Yeah, that's down from 9, but it's still 5.4. It's not, it's more than twice, 2. It's almost three times 2%. Gash, excuse me, garbage and trash collection. I guess you call it gash. Garbage and trash collection, 5.3. Water sewage, 5.3. Stuff you got to uh, get uh, some procedures done. Dental, 4.1. Optometry, glasses, 4.1. Hospital, 7.7. .7. Outpatient, 8.2. Elderly home care, is all the way up to 13.9. So you're talking about, you know, high levels. Let's talk about driving a car. Not only is gasoline more expensive, vehicle maintenance up 7.6, vehicle repair up 9.8, vehicle insurance up 22.6%. There's parking up 6.6. .6. There's tolls up 7.3. Where is this low inflation? It's not in these numbers. It's not in the things that people pay every single day. Recreation, 4.1. Shipping costs up 7.1%. And if you have a pet, you're kind of screwed. Pet services and food, pet food, 4.5. Veterinarian services, 7.1. So, you know, I don't think people are going to be dumping their pets. They'd rather borrow more on their credit cards to pay the bills. So in that same thought process, what makes it really interesting is that we said all along, we said, and it was the Captain Crunch episode of the podcast a couple episodes ago in February, all right, we basically said a credit crunch would be the worst thing, and that's what we kind of see starting to come. And guess what? All of a sudden, the Fed's consumer credit number for March, it's lagged by one month, but the March number, revolving credit, 0.1% growth annualized down from 9.7 in February, 7.3 in January, 7.5 in the fourth quarter of last year, 8.9 third quarter last year, 8.3 second quarter last year, 9.2 first quarter last year, 15.1 in 2022, and it's now 0 0.1. Hello, credit crunch. Overall consumer credit, 3.2, all right, which is less than the inflation rate. This is really bad i mean it really is i mean this the flow all right when you do the annualized flow of credit revolving credit which is mostly credit cards 1.8 billion in march down from 128.7 billion in february let me say that again from 128 billion to two 
a decline of 98.6% in the annualized flow of revolving credit in March from February. These numbers are dramatic. They really are. And then when you say, well, you know, why is that? Well, again, all right, we're talking about, you know, 44% of consumers, more than double that think you'll see a target rate of 2% in inflation, think it'll be above four. And because of that, in the same Fed uh, household slash consumer survey, the 12 month forward, I'm going to be better off or worse off in your uh, household's financial situation. The percentage saying much worse off, more than doubled in April, more than doubled to five, just under double. No, more than doubled to 5.5, up from 2.8 in March. Those saying much better off fell, and the differential went from plus 2.6 to better off, much better off, to minus 1.1, much worse off. These are not coincident, non-coincidental facts. These are, you know, related to one another. Consumers see higher inflation, think they're going to be worse off, and are cutting all of a sudden even their use of credit cards. Also, of course, senior loan officer survey told us that, you know, the, they're going to be tightening standards and conditions uh, on credit and terms on credit cards and auto loans for the balance of the year. All right. So aside from the Fed changing the narrative, nothing has changed for the better for the consumer. In fact, it's gotten a lot worse just in the last couple of weeks with the data that's been released. I mean, so when you kind of look at that, you know, you're not out of the woods yet. All right. But the fact of the matter is the dollar came off because of the comments from the Fed. And because when you're talking about, you know, the dollar coming off, that's bullish for all asset prices. And that's kind of what happened. All right. But things for the consumer are much worse. Let's look at the retail sales number that came out last week. All right. The retail sales came in at a 3% year over year below inflation for the fourth month in a row and for 11 out of the last 14 months below inflation. All right. Not only that, the year over year increase in actual dollars spent, retail sales, all right, is this number's not price adjusted. There's no inflation adjustment. It's seasonally adjusted, but it's not inflation adjusted. So the year over year change nominally, what they reported to get your 3.3% change was an increase from April of last year from 684 roughly to 705 billion for the month was 20.8 billion. The price differential was 23.27 billion, roughly speaking, not doing it by category by category, which means price increases represented more than 100% of the gain in sales. And on a real basis, sales actually fell two and a half billion dollars from a year ago. And in fact, when we look at the year over year rate, it's been negative relative to inflation for 11 of the last 14 months. I mean, when you talk about outright deflation, not including the price adjustment, which makes it much worse, furniture, building materials, garden supplies, sporting goods, books, and music stores. When you include the price adjustment, it extends to electronics, appliances, and clothing. What are these? They're discretionary. Discretionary. The only things that are up are online and gas and food. Let's take vehicles down over a billion for the month which took the year-over-year rate of change in sales from 3.2 down to 0.8. Car sales, a 0.8 year-over-year, lost 75% of its year-over-year growth rate in a single month. Hello? I mean, hello? Not only that, but credit card debt not only you know was only 0.1 annualized, but actually told the total fell for the first quarter. And when consumers say they're worse off, take the housing numbers too, and then home builders... The NHAB housing index, 45 for the month of May. That's the lowest May since 2014, and the traffic of prospective buyers, the lowest since 2012. And, of course, the XHB gets hit. So it's going to be kind of, you know, it is to whatever extent you have the Fed funds already beginning to price in a rate cut this year, if not maybe a second one. And that, in turn, is dropping the dollar's yield premium over Europe. As our interest rates come down, Europe's kind of stay where they are because they've been a lot lower. They've already come down. Now the U.S. is coming down to kind of match them. You're eroding the premium you get paid to hold dollars, which weakened the dollar last week. And this was key, 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 key to the markets 
was the weakening of the dollar. So in that context, you saw all asset prices rise. But what rose the most? Commodities and precious metals, particularly gold, silver, copper. You know, these were the things that outperformed. These are where we have been allocated in our portfolio playbook, which is a product we sell to family offices and retail investors. And uh, it's, it's a really good equity-based product that gives you a different way of looking at things in kind of this new era where just buying and holding stocks is not going to keep pace with the debasement of the purchasing power of your, of your currency. And then you say, well, you know, gold has been disappointing. A lot of people haven't liked gold, and then they liked it, and it didn't perform. Guess what? This is the whole time the dollar's been strong, and gold has still performed. How do we know that? Because it's at new highs against the dollar, even though the performance up until recently was really choppy. All right? People were de- disappointed by that. So what happened? Well, bottom line is you, you have a situation where people dump their gold. People dump their silver. Uh, you're talking about who's, who's buying? Well, ETF sales. We're down by, what was the number in ETF sales? It was 700 tons since July of 2022. 700 tons worth of gold was sold in the ETFs. Coin sales were down for the first time since 2019 in the first quarter on a quarterly basis in 2024, for the first quarter, January through March. All right, at the same time, Swiss and UK imports were down 14 of the last 18 months. Why is that important? It means the bullion banks aren't the ones buying gold. All right. So who's buying gold? Chinese have been buying gold. Big time. Big time. All right. Gold imports, a record in January, 225 tons. That's a lot of gold. The PBOC, People's Bank of China, stopped reporting their gold buying. So now the numbers are kind of difficult to find. So we rely on some private estimates. Uh, One of the more respected estimates puts the gold purchases last year at 700, where was it? 725 tons for the year, all right? Last year, total central bank purchases were 1,000 tons. 75% of total central bank purchases were in China. And it's the only the last two years are the only time ever central bank purchases of gold were 1,000 tons within a year. So the central bank, you know, is really accumulating gold big time in China when you're talking about that kind of, uh, accumulation: 590 tons in 2022, 725,000 tons last year, 225 tons, 725 tons, not thousand tons. 225 tons in January means o- almost 1,600 tons of gold China has taken off the market in the last 28 months. That's an enormous amount of gold. It really is. So within that context, I also want to let you know that I have put together. A really cool chart package. It's going to be our our chart pack for this podcast, the chart book that will accommodate this podcast. I have a lot of the Fed stuff in there on the consumer. I have all of this on gold, all right, and the Chinese numbers, and it's really fascinating to look at all of this. I then talk about, well, what's next? I mean, we were long cocoa. We were long coffee. We've been long gold and silver. I mean, it's kind of, we've kind of been doing really well, knock on wood, because you never want to say that publicly. But yes, we've, we've nailed it here. And yeah, we got a little bearish there in the stock market. We were stopped out very quickly as soon as the Fed spoke and we understood, look, right away, the Fed is doing kind of what we thought we did. We can't be short stocks into this environment because dollar lower means stocks higher. It's the tightest correlation of anything. The fact that the consumer is still choking doesn't matter right now because even the consumer discretionary stocks are breaking out. And that's problematic. So I will wait to pounce when that time comes, when you have an economic reality check. But in the meantime, you have a tremendous opportunity right now in some of these markets. I mean, copper, I mean, the, the, the warehouse inventories of copper available for delivery into the futures market is historically low. It's true about aluminum, tin, zinc, and to a lesser extent, nickel. And the DBB is the base metal ETF, soaring, really taking off here. Copper and the COPX, which is the copper ETF, I mean, copper's at a record high in price. And we called that all the way. It's been one of our biggest plays along with cocoa. I mean, this is, you know, in that context. So what I want to do, too, is within this whole, you know, kind of presentation, is give you two specific portfolios that are really simple, 
all right, that is, is kind of like a baseline to go from when you create your own portfolio. One is equities only, and I'm not saying I want to be 100% long equities. I don't, all right? But I'm just going to say, look, I'm going to pick the top five equity sector ETS from the S&P 500, all right? So standard and poor's equity sectors will be one portfolio, the top five, and then the second five will be like uh, currency, commodity, bond, uh, and other and foreign equity index ETFs. All right. I'm calling it my starting five. And the idea came from the fact that all of a sudden, I mean, the stock market allocations have gone from, you know, this high tech into the defensive stocks, staples, materials and utilities. And now that it's NBA, you know, playoff season, the chant is defense, defense. That's the chant in the stock market right now, even though it's at new highs, it's more of a defensive posture in the breakdown of the sectors. Right. So I'm going to say take a basketball analogy and just say my starting five. My starting five in the S&P 500 sectors, financials, XLF, industrials, XLI, materials, XLB, consumer, staples, XLP, and utilities, XLU. I got three defensive players. I got the round mound, the rebound in the utilities. All right, that's defensive, materials, and staples defensive. And I got the two bombers from three-point range that are you know can go on a hot streak, industrials and financials. In the other area, in terms of you know the commodities, currencies, and bonds, and again, five, my starting five, and just basically you can say, hey, let's just say 20% in each. I still think this will outperform the overall S&P 500. The, the currency, and you can then just take all 10 and do 5%. You know, do whatever you want with these. You know, it's not black box, but it's just to give you more information in exactly what we're doing and what has been successful and the things that I think will continue to be successful and what's new and what's coming. And in this case, you know, the uh, commodity, currency, bond, uh, foreign uh, foreign country ETF portfolio right now, the starting five is the silver mining shares, the SIL, we felt that for about two weeks, NLR, uranium and nuclear energy, COPX, the copper mining shares, DBB, the base metal shares, and instead of gold, we've swapped now into platinum at a $1,500 discount to gold and own the PPLT platinum ETF. In terms of markets, real quickly, that could be coming next, um, and again, I have the whole chart book here that has all of this, including all these markets. If you want it, email me, sales at weldenonline.com. I should have said that earlier. I mean, it's 40 pages. It's easy reading. It's mostly charts. And I think there's a treasure trove of information. We're offering it to you for free. Just send me your email address and we'll shoot it out to you. But within this too, there's two new commodities right now that I think have tremendous potential upside opportunity. So email me to get the chart pack, to get the chart book, to get all of these charts for free on all of these topics we just discovered, including all these markets, the portfolio breakdowns, and all the macro stuff on the consumer from the Fed. And uh, not only that, but looking at the U.S. debt. I mean, you know, when you start talking about gold, all you have to do is look at the debt numbers, look at the fact that in February the government spent twice as much as revenue was, and that, you know, public borrowing from the as a means to finance the public debt is over $1.2 trillion in just the last five months. This makes the case for, for stuff over paper, and I still hold to the exit stage left as it applies to just being passively invested in the stock market. You will not keep pace with the next round of debasement in the purchasing power of paper currencies. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, at Weldon Live, and don't forget to follow the podcast on Twitter, at Money underscore Podcast, and a lot of cool videos on my YouTube page. That is, uh, you know, user backslash Gregory underscore Weldon on YouTube.